Oh, good. It sounds like we might be on. Yay. Thank you so much for your patience, everyone, and especially Lauren, who's so generously here um, to giving, giving her time to all of us. I'm so happy. So we're just going to start over. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's great. And I thank you again all so much for your patience. And, um, and especially, like I said, especially you, Lauren, thank you so much. Sure, no problem. So, um, so this is Cascadia Speaks, uh, Native Trees of Cascadia. Um, you all know the chat box because we've been chatting, trying to get everything working um, properly. And thank you all so much for that. Um, so I'm going to introduce you again, Lauren. This is um, Lauren Grand is our presenter today. She is a Washington State University Forestry Program Coordinator who joined Washington State University Extension as the North Puget Sound Forestry Program Coordinator two years ago. She has her bachelor's in science in environmental science and education from the University of California at Berkeley and a master's degree in forest resources from the University of Washington. She has spent several years of her career conducting forest ecology research throughout Northern California and the Pacific Northwest. Lauren has also worked in the private sector as a sustainability and wood certification consultant for a wood manufacturing company in Vietnam. Now Lauren enjoys exploring wetlands for signs of amphibians and facilitating forestry education programs for Northwestern Washington. So thank you so much for being here today, Lauren, and thank you for your patience, and we're really excited about Cascadian trees. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is really fun and a great experience despite technical difficulties. Um, so I'm just going to give a little bit of a background about Extension because uh, a lot of people don't get to hear about what a great program it is uh, before I start. And Extension is a offshoot of a land grant university. So in Washington, Washington State University. And I think a couple of you are in Oregon. So Oregon State University is the land grant university there. And what Extension does is they bring scientifically based research information into the classroom for community members. So we put on classes and workshops and informational um, programs for people who are not students attending the university for generally for the general public and so this is a really great opportunity for me to be able to share uh, some really great information about native trees with you all so thank you so much for having me um, this presentation I do have to thank Kevin Zobrist he put this presentation together um, and it's a really good presentation so I thought why not recreate might as well not recreate the wheel and he does a lot of native tree presentations around Washington State. So if you ever see something come up, if you're in Washington, um, he's a really good and entertaining presenter to watch on native trees as well. So, um, so to let's get to the presentation already, right? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about how to identify some of these native trees that are in the forests in northwest Washington and northwest Oregon. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of their silvical characteristics. And that's basically a fancy way of saying I'm going to tell you how they grow and what sort of climatic um, tolerances they have. So I'm going to start off by talking about how we group trees. Um, you usually refer to trees as conifers or broadleaf trees or deciduous trees. Um, conifers are typically um, cone bearing and broadleaves um, usually lose their trees, their, sorry, their leaves in the winter. Um, other common term, these common terms though, typically aren't always accurate because there are conifer trees like the larch that lose their leaves in the winter. And there are broadleaf trees like madrone that keep their leaves all year round. So sometimes we think that maybe the purest terms that we can use are gymnosperms, um, which literally means naked seeds and angiosperms, which are flowering and fruiting plants. So, but be aware that you often encounter these different terms used interchangeably. So, 
Uh, there are many ways that a tree can be identified, and you can do that by looking at the leaves, so the type of, whether they're more needle-like or they're more flat, uh, the types of buds that they have, specifically the shape of the bud and where they are on the tree. Uh, the types of branches, whether they droop down, whether they point upward, if they're opposite of each other. Their cones, whether they sit upright on the tree, if they hang down. So there's a lot of different ways that you can look at these things. Bark, um, and even the silhouette of the tree. Sometimes they're very cone-shaped or they have a droopy top, and that's very distinguishing characteristic of certain trees. And then it's smell. A lot of people forget to use all of their senses. Smell is a really important part of identifying native trees. Crumpling up the leaves and taking a good whiff can give you a very clear distinction about a type of tree or at least add to a way that you can identify a type of tree. And then also um, the bark itself can sometimes have a very distinct smell. So usually it takes a combination of these features, but sometimes you'll have a single distinctive feature that will give you a pretty distinct positive ID. Um, so, but also something to keep in mind is that there can be a wide variability in some of the features for any given tree. So, and that can be based on how old the tree is or the location of where that tree is growing, if it's getting a lot of light versus very little light, or, um, you know, just some, also genetic variability. Some trees, you know, on if we have a certain type of tree on the east side versus a certain type of tree on the west side, just the genetic makeup of those trees will be a little bit different. So they'll look slightly different. And one example of that is the bark. So I have two pictures of bark here and I'll ask my question again. Um, so does anybody know what type of tree is on the left hand side? in this slide. And I guess this will also be our check to make sure everything's still working. Okay, no takers. What about the tree on the right? Does anyone have an idea of this one? It's pretty white bark. So we did have um, uh, a couple of guesses on that on that one on the oh, on the left, Lauren. Yeah. Okay, so um, there nothing's coming up in my chat box. Okay, I'm I'm sorry about that, but I'll just feed them to you. So okay, um, yeah, so so we did have a guess of a, a conifer, a cedar, or a conifer. So, um, so now we'll wait and see if anybody has something to say about what the right, right the right tree is. Okay. Because I put that question in the chat box too, and they can hear you also. So were there any responses for the tree on the right side? Somebody guessed, somebody guessed about the tree on the right being an alder tree. An alder, okay. That's a good guess. That's a good guess. <laughs> so if I didn't make this presentation, I would also guess that it could be an alder tree or maybe like a paper birch tree. But in fact, both these trees are Douglas fir trees. And so this is just an example of where the bark can be a little bit deceiving based on the age of the tree. So the Douglas fir tree on the left side is much older. It's had more time to develop its bark. And the tree on the right side is much younger. And so it's just starting that new thin bark. It's a little blistery, uh, a little white. So it's, it's very different. So this would be a good situation to make sure that you look at some of the other distinguishing features of Douglas fir before you make a split decision about what type of tree it is. And I'll talk about those now. <clears throat> so the Douglas fir is probably the tree that you see the most in our region. Um, 
It is the most common in our lowland forests. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's the most important lumber species that we have. It grows really fast and it has pretty superior strength properties. So it's very desirable commercially. And so it not only is it native, um, a native dominant tree, so it's it naturally exists here a lot, but was also planted a lot um, for commercial purposes. So that's why um, those two things together make it so common. Um, Douglas fir is also a versatile tree that is found throughout all of Western North America, but it has some different forms and characteristics depending on the environment that it's in. So I'm going to talk about the coastal tree form, um, usually referred to as the subspecies Menziesii. Um, so that's these are the traits of the Douglas fir that we're going to that we see where we live. Um, Douglas fir is not actually a true fir, which is why its name is hyphenated. Um, it is the largest member of the pine family, and it has several distinguishing characteristics that make it easy to identify. So on mature trees, it develops that deep furrowed bark that we looked at in our previous slide. But on younger trees, it has a very smooth but blistery bark. So we saw that distinction again also on the, the previous slide. Um, the Douglas fir has light green needles with two bands on the underside. Um, these are referred to as stomatal bands, and that's where the tree's breathing pores are located. So stomata is another um, term, is, is the fancy term for breathing hole, basically. And then the needles are arranged spirally around the twig of the tree, like a, a bottle brush, or I like to say squirrel tail, too. Um, and when you crush up those leaves, they smell very citrusy. So it has a brown lancelet bud. So if you're looking at the picture in the bottom left, that bud is very pointy. That's what we mean by lancelet bud. Um, and they look like the tip of a spear almost. And um, that is a very particular trait of a Douglas fir. So none of our other trees are going to have that trait. So if you see that bud, you know for sure it's a Douglas fir. Um, another very particular characteristic of Douglas fir is its cones. Uh, these are pendant cones, which means that they hang down off the branch of the tree like uh, the pendant to a necklace. And they have these three pronged woody brackets sticking out of them. Um, and so you can see this in the picture all the way to the right. Um, there's actually some folklore around why these cones look like they do. And they suggest that brackets, um, that these brackets look like this because there was a great fire or storm in the forest and all the mice ran and took refuge into the Douglas fir cones. And so those brackets actually look like the two feet and a tail to the back end of a mouse sticking out inside these cones. So if you see those, um, it's pretty distinctive. There's no other tree in our region that have little mouse tails sticking out of their cones. So Douglas fir is um, um, a very fast growing tree in our region. And um, one of the reasons for that is because it's very shade intolerant, which means that it needs a lot of sunlight to survive. Um, especially our coastal subspecies. Um, some of the Douglas fir that you'll see east of the Cascade Mountains, um, they, do, they can survive in more shaded areas underneath ponderosa pine trees, but on, our, on the west side of the Cascade Mountains, they need a lot more sun, so they typically are the first trees to grow after other trees have been cut down or if there's a fire or a windstorm. And so on, on the west side of the Cascades, they need an open area with full sunlight and exposed mineral soil to be able to regenerate. So they grow within 20 to 30 feet per in the, within the first 10 years of their life. And they don't really like really wet soils. So they're usually a little bit higher on a hill, um, not on the edges of ponds or streams too often. Um, they're also pretty well adapted to fire, and the way that they're adapted to fire is that their thick bark insulates uh, their 
cambium or the living cells in the stem of the tree from lower intensity fires. But in our region, sometimes every few hundred years, we get pretty large catastrophic fires that kill all the trees in the area. But because Douglas fir regenerates well in open sunlight areas with bare mineral soil, it's a perfect opportunity for Douglas fir to come back in and grow in the areas where that fire was before. So fires actually help set up an opportunity for a new Douglas fir forest to start over. Um, so the pre-settlement old growth Douglas fir stands of the West Cascades were actually probably originated by a large fire. Um, Douglas fir lives for a very long time, uh, usually 750 years or more, and it can grow up to 200 to 300 feet tall, and it can, its diameter can be from 10 to 15 feet wide. So one of the major issues with Douglas fir in our area is that it's susceptible to root rot. Um, and so that's one of the major health issues with this tree. So if we have large, fir, uh, large forests of only Douglas fir trees, then if we, there's an area with root rot, it spreads more easily. And there can be um, high mortality of Douglas fir in those areas. But if we're good forest managers, then we know to increase our biodiversity and we can help to um, ameliorate that problem. So that's our Douglas fir tree. So the next tree I'm going to talk about, oh, and Douglas fir tree is the state tree of Oregon, for those of you from Oregon. <laughs> um, Western hemlock is the next tree I'm going to talk about. Um, it's an associate of the Douglas fir tree, and it is the state tree of Washington, for those of you in Washington. Um, and it has a number of commercial uses as lumber, plywood, and paper products. And Western hemlock is easy to identify. Um, because of its silhouette. So this is one of those trees that I mentioned that has the droopy top. So from a distance, if you look at its top, it looks like it's wearing a witch's hat. And so you can sort of see that in the picture all the way to the right. So um, the Western hemlock tree has very different foliage compared to Douglas fir. Um, its needles are very short and they're blunt tipped. And they form flat sprays. They don't spiral around the tree, the branch, the way that the Douglas fir did. Um, they're very green on top. And they also have two white bands on the bottom where the tree breathes from. Um, but you'll notice that on these leaves, on the picture to the upper left, um, there's a mix of longer and shorter needles. And that's sort of what makes up its Latin name. So the Latin name is Suga heterophylla, where Suga means hemlock and heterophylla means different leaves. Um, so that's so that's how it got its name, just because those needles are very different sizes. And then also one thing about the needles that you notice with hemlock is that they don't hold on to the branches very strong. So if you're not really sure if it's a hemlock or not, give it a little shake if it's a younger tree. And if the needles rain down on you, there's another good way to identify if it's a hemlock tree because giving it a little shake will definitely make lots of needles rain down. Um, the bark of this tree is pretty rough, but it's not nearly thick or as deeply furrowed as a Douglas fir tree is. Um, and then western hemlock cones are very small and they're pretty egg-shaped. So western hemlock is one of our species that likes um, moist, cool, shady areas. So you'll often find it growing in the understory. So as the, a younger tree in a forest with much older trees above it, um, it doesn't grow as fast as Douglas fir. It only gets to about 15 years in, uh, sorry, 15 feet in the first 10 years. And then he Western hemlock likes moist, but not wet, super wet areas. So basically it can be soggy near the edge of a pond, but it can't be, in the water for an extended period of time. Um, it'll grow up to 200 feet tall and about as wide as four feet in diameter. Um, its lifespan is usually much shorter than Douglas fir, so about 200 to 400 years, um, which is much shorter compared to Douglas fir at 750 years. Um, but it takes advantage of that because it's very prolific. Um, 
what it does is it excels in its regeneration. So it creates a lot of seeds and seedlings that can survive and wait in the understory where it's really shady and wet until there's some open space for it to grow. And then it grows really well um, underneath the canopy. And it grow and it puts out a ton of seedlings. So you'll often see these carpets of western hemlock through the forest floor. So some and then um, some of its weaknesses are that it's um, susceptible to things like uh, heavy wind throw or uh, some sort of soil disturbance. So if there's a logging operation, then it might not always survive um, being too disturbed. So that's Washington State tree. So the next tree that we see quite often is the Western Red Cedar. And Western Red Cedar is often considered the king of the Northwest trees and commonly because it's the hardiest and longest lived. Um, this tree is very important to native cultures and it's commercially prized for its fragrant and decay resistant wood. Um, its wood is often used for shingles, shakes, siding, and decking. So you'll see that a lot in, in um, homes. Um, but it has its highest commercial value as the lumber for trees. So we, um, it actually is more expensive than Douglas fir right now. So Western Red Cedar is uh, really easy to recognize because it's a very unique foliage. Um, rather than needles, it has these leaves that overlap like scales and they're sort of white and waxy and they look almost on the underside like little butterflies. If you can sort of see, look up closely in the picture on the upper left, that's the bottom of the needle. And those white bands are their stomata. So there's form this little X that make a butterfly pattern. And so that's where the cedars breathe from. Um, its fragrant foliage is light green, um, but its very innermost leaves often turn bright orange in the fall. So a lot of the times in the fall, you'll see these trees um, with all the inside branches turning orange, and people get really concerned that their cedars are dying or the cedars in their area are, are all dying. Um, but what happens is, is the tree is just going through this natural cycling of its needles. So evergreen trees do have live leaves on them all year long, but that doesn't mean they keep all of their leaves through their whole life. They still make more at the edge of their branches and then drop the leaves closer to the stem of the tree um, as the tree gets larger. And so in the fall, what you're seeing is the tree dropping the foliage that's closer to its stem. And then once there's a big windstorm, it'll all blow off and the tree looks green and healthy again. So if you ever see that, you can tell your friend who might be worried about the dying cedars and, and hopefully they'll, they'll feel reprieve from that. <laughs> so they produce um, these small clusters of egg-shaped cones that I think are gorgeous because I think they look like little woody roses. Um, and that's the picture that you're seeing in the bottom left corner. Um, and then the bark is a reddish brown and it's thin and stringy. Um, and the base of the tree sort of gets swollen and almost grows these foot-like woody ridges. So it's almost like the tree has feet. Um, just, just like Douglas fir isn't actually a fir tree, uh, the western red cedar is not actually a cedar tree. Um, true cedars actually have needles and they're in the pine family. And those aren't native to North America. They actually grow in the Himalayan and Mediterranean regions. Um, the common ornamental cedar that you'll see around here is Theodora cedar. And so those are what true cedars actually look like. Um, but cedar, the word, actually means fragrant wood, which is how these trees became known as cedars. And so western red cedar is in the Thuga genus, making it an arborvitae, which means the tree of life. And so western cedar is also known as jar giant arborvitae. So if you see a sign in the, um, like at a nursery or in a store of arborvitae, that's, it's usually a, a cedar tree. 
So Western Red Cedar has some um, important similar to Western Hemlock in that it's shade tolerant, meaning that it grows well under a canopy. And it'll grow about 15 feet in its first 10 years. So, and then trees that are more shade tolerant tend to grow more slowly because they don't need as much sunlight. Um, and then also like hemlock, red cedars prefer really moist sites and they don't, they can't tolerate drought very well. Um, what's different is that they can tolerate really wet sites and often can grow in swampy areas where the water level goes above their roots for an extended period of time. Um, but where cedar really stands out from the other species in our region is that is is its resilience. So for instance, it can resist root diseases that typically affect most of our other conifer trees. And it's also really resistant to physical injuries. So if like there was a huge fire or if a piece of machinery bumped into it and took out of a big chunk, it would create a little scar. Well, not a little scar, but it would create a scar on the bark of the tree, but it typically wouldn't kill the tree. It would just grow around the scar. And then often it can even grow for a thousand, it can grow for about a thousand years. And so a lot of times those older trees will be rotten in the center, but be really sturdy on the outside. So they're really resilient to many different types of injuries. And then those thousand year old trees can typically grow up to 200 feet tall and be about 20 feet in diameter at its largest. So these are really big, beautiful trees, and I can understand why they would call them the king of the fort, the Northwest. So another really common tree is our red alder, and that's what the guess was of our bark picture earlier. And red alder is a broadleaf tree in our area. Um, it's a common species in lower elevation areas, and Originally, it was considered a weed because everybody wanted to grow Douglas fir for its um, commercial purposes. But just like Douglas fir, um, this tree species is a sun lover. And so it typically um, will regenerate or grow really fast on previously disturbed sites. So sites that have seen a fire or there was a lot of wind or there was a logging operation. But now people are realizing that it does have some commercial value, so they're not seeing it as a weed tree so much anymore. So alder has coarsely tooth leaves that are green on the top and light colored with reddish brown hairs underneath. And the edges of the, tr the leaves curl under. So this is a very distinguishing characteristic of red alder. So if you see a tree and you're not sure if it's a birch or an alder or what type of alder, um, red alder, I'm going to, so I'm going to, if you watch the leaf on your bottom left hand screen, I'm going to flip that leaf over and you'll see how the edges of the leaf curl under. That's very distinctive. You won't see that in any other species. So that's how you know you've got a red alder tree. And then those leaves alternate, um, meaning that they'll grow out from the left and the right side on the branch in an alternating pattern. So they'll go have a leaf on the left and then a leaf on the right and then a leaf on the left and then a leaf on the right. Um, alder trees have both male and female flowers and um, the male flowers are long cylindrical catkins that make a lot of mess in the spring. <laughs> um, typically um, typically that that yellow powder that is all over everything um, in the spring. And then the female flowers mature into little woody cones called strobiles, and they remain on the tree throughout the winter. So the catkins are on the upper left corner um, in one, and then the cones are all the way to the left. So red alder has a brownish gray bark, brownish gray bark that's really thin and smooth and has horizontal markings on it called lenticels. Um, the bark of older trees tend to have these lighter white patches on them. And these white areas are actually not part of the bark. They're actually a type of crustose lichen, meaning that they form a crust that you can't separate off of the bark. So the actual color of the bark of the tree is that brown 
that you're seeing behind those white spots. And then those white spots are actually the lichen on top of that. And they um, grow throughout the bark so that you can't actually separate the two. They're not harmful to the tree at all. And they're actually really great to see because they mean that we have a good indicator of air quality in our area. So if you're seeing a lot of red alder with these white spots, you know you're in, a, in an area that has good clean air. But if they're all brown, then you may not want to frequent that area very much because you might have some trouble breathing in the future. So um, red alder gets its name from the red dye that you can make from its inner bark and the red stain that it develops over freshly cut wood. So if you ever see a red alder stump, there's usually a very bright red ring around the edge. Um, there's another alder that grows in our area. It's called a Sitka alder, but it's a small shrubby species that doesn't typically look like a tree. So you won't really be able to, you'll be able to tell the difference if you see anything. And then alder is in the birch family. So red alder is what we would call a pioneer species, and that's because it quickly colonizes disturb, uh, disturbed sites, um, even sometimes growing faster than Douglas fir trees. Um, it seeds really rapidly, and it grow, can grow up to 40 feet in the first 10 years. So it's really, really fast. Um, it's very intolerant of shade, so it has to be the first tree that grows in an area, otherwise you won't see red alder in that area. Um, it does like moist areas, and you'll usually find it next to uh, streams. And it usually grows with salmonberry, too. So there's always a nice alder salmonberry thicket near when you're getting close to water. Usually a good indicator of that. So alder arrives and establishes quickly, um, but it's pretty short-lived compared to the conifer trees that we've already talked about today. Um, it only lives to about 60 to 80 years old before it starts to fall apart. I'm sorry, it only lives to about 60 years old before it starts to fall apart, and then typically they don't live longer than 80 years. Um, they can grow to 120 feet tall and up to three feet in diameter, before they start to fall apart though. So that's a lot of growth in a very short amount of time. It's pretty impressive. And one of the interesting characteristics of red alder is that it fixes nitrogen. And what that means is that you can take all the nitrogen out of our atmosphere and um, convert it into a chemical, It take, I'm sorry, it takes nitrogen out of our atmosphere and it converts it into a chemical form that can be used by plants. So, Basically, a lot of issues with growing certain plants is that it has poor soil nutrition and usually because of a lack of nitrogen. But alder actually has this symbiotic relationship with bacteria in its uh, roots, which are these nodules that you're seeing in this picture here. And so the bacteria are found inside those nodules. And what they do is they turn they take the sugar from the alder and then they in turn convert the nitrogen from the atmosphere into a form of nitrogen that the plant can use for its nutrition. And it, some of it goes into the soil and some of it goes into the tree. And so it actually adds back nitrogen to the soil. So alder and some other nitrogen fixing plants can actually grow in very poor soil areas because it has this nitrogen rich bacteria that it works together with. Um, and then that, <clears throat> excuse me, and so, so that nitrogen goes into the tree and into the leaves and when the trees drop their leaves in the winter, they decompose and provide basically a fertilizer to enrich that soil for other plants growing there. So it's, it's kind of a really neat tree to be able to have around. So we have another broadleaf tree that's pretty common. It's called big leaf maple. And <clears throat> one of the pretty obvious features of identifying this tree is its leaves, <clears throat> which the name implies grow very, very large. Um, 
sometimes they exceed about a foot in width. They're typically always larger than my face, so it's always fun to put big leaf maple leaves in front of your face. If you haven't tried it, it's always a good time. Um, so the leaves have five lobes, um, which can help you distinguish between a big leaf maple and another, any other type of maple. Um, so, because sometimes the younger big leaf maple, their leaves will be small still. So they only, if they only have five lobes, then you'll know that's a big leaf maple. Um, the vine maple is another common tree that we have, um, and it has nine, seven to nine lobes. And I'll show you a picture of that on the next slide or two. Um, and then the Rocky Mountain maple, which is less common, uh, has even fewer lobes and it has serrated edges. So we'll see more pictures of that in a minute. Big leaf maple is an attractive tree all seasons of the year. Um, in the spring, it puts out hanging clusters of yellow flowers, uh, which you'll see in the picture in the upper middle. And then these flowers are edible. So some people like to add them to salads or just have them as a snack when they're hiking. And um, in the summer, the rich green leaves create a beautiful canopy and the leaves turn yellow and orange in the autumn. So the flowers eventually will develop into those winged seeds. Uh, a lot of people call helicopter seeds. And so they twirl and spin as they, they fall to the ground. And these are windblown seeds. So the autumn wind will blow them in as helicopters throughout the forest and um, that's how they spread out their seeds to be able to um, to be able to regenerate. So a uh, big leaf maple also you'll notice typically houses a lot of mosses and ferns on its bark. And um, the reason for that is its bark is pretty moist and very calcium rich. And so it's a really good habitat for um, epiphytic plants. So um, basically plants will attach itself to the bark just because it's a good habitat for those particular plants and they don't hurt the bark at all. Um, and the tree, it doesn't mean the tree is in poor health, it's just it offers a great alternative to the ground for things like licorice fern and mosses. Um, and Another edible thing about big leaf maple is that those ferns that grow on them are typically licorice fern. And if you, they're like a small single stemmed fern. And if you chew on the bottom of it, it tastes like licorice. So if you're a licorice fan, you may want to try that. So let's talk about some characteristics of big leaf maple. Um, it's a very vigorously growing tree. Um, it grows up to 40 feet in the first 10 years, so it grows quickly just like alder. Um, and it sprouts pretty prolifically. So if you try to cut down a big leaf maple, it's tenacious. It'll grow back with a ton of sprouts. Um, so they're very hard to get rid of, but they're beautiful trees, so I couldn't imagine why you'd want to. Um, so this could provide a lot of competition if you're, say, a tree farmer and you would prefer Douglas fir trees because they're more economically viable. Um, but typically, uh, they do pretty well in mixed conifer and broadleaf species forests. Um, so one thing, though, that differentiates this tree from the other fast-growing trees that we talked about, the red alder and the Douglas fir, is that big leaf maple, though it is fast-growing, it's also shade tolerant. So it can grow underneath the canopy. So it is one of those trees that can come in later on and establish itself. So if you already have alder or Douglas fir in an area, that doesn't mean you're not going to see big leaf maple there sometime in the future. Um, so big leaf maple can grow on a variety of sites. It prefers moist sites, but um, you can often find it in many different areas. Um, and it has very nutrient-rich leaves that also help to enrich the soil. Um, not quite the same as the alders uh, nitrogen fixation, but there is a lot of good uh, nutrients in those leaves as well. Um, so 
Big leaf maple isn't typically used in our region for commercial purposes. Sometimes um, you can find it for some specialty products such as furniture and musical instruments. Um, maples do though, however, develop in some cases highly prized figured wood grain. So it'll have some burls that people like to use in their wood making shops, or it, have a, it has a very curly grain on it where people often like to make really expensive wood out of. Big leaf maple is really great for firewood and it can be tapped for maple syrup. So most people think you can only get maple syrup from sugar maples, but um, big leaf maple makes a very good maple syrup that has typically has a vanilla flavor to it. And um, the only difference is that it, you have to boil off. It has a little bit more water in it, so you have to boil it off um, more to be able to reach the sugar content. So, but for if any of you own property and have some big leaf maples, you may consider it a fun project to try out. Okay, so these are the other small maples that I was talking about earlier. The, the vine maple, if you can see, the leaves stay about that size and they have usually seven to nine lobes. So there's a, there's a lot more of those, um, of those protrusions out from the leaf than the big leaf maple that has only five. And then the Rocky Mountain maple has typically only three, excuse me, three lobes and they're, double serrated compared to the big leaf maple. So I'm gonna go back to the big leaf maple leaf. You see how those are pretty smooth on the edges. Um, if I go back to the Rocky Mountain maple and the vine maple, those have uh, very, they're serrated on, with, on each of the lobes as well. So there's another distinguishing characteristic. All right, let's talk about black cottonwood. Um, black cottonwood is also common referred to as poplar in our area. Um, delicious for beavers, they love it. Um, so this is the last tree that I'm gonna talk about in uh, this series that we've done of the most common, what we call our big six trees. Um, this tree is usually pretty familiar to people because of its floating um, cotton tufts. So it sort of always looks like it's snowing in the spring and that's a result of this particular tree. Um, cottonwoods grow very tall and very straight and they can be actually about 200 feet tall and they always have these very straight ridgy barks. Um, so if you're ever not sure if you have a cottonwood or a maple, uh, Maplewood, I'm sorry, Cottonwood has very straight ridges in the bark. Um, and Cottonwood is actually our fastest growing tree. Uh, they have very thick leaves and they're dark green, but pale underneath. And they're very heart shaped. Um, and their stem that attaches them to the branch are perfectly round. So the leaves often blow in the wind very easily. They're very pretty. They almost look like they're waving at you. Black cottonwood has male and female flowers, but they're on separate trees. Whereas remember the red alder had them on the same tree. There are separate male and female trees for black cottonwood. And the female flowers um, mature into round capsules that open up and release those cottony seeds that you see that make it snow in May and June. And then the cottonwood trees have a very pronounced scent, especially when um, the sticky resinous buds open up in the spring. So it's a very heavily sweet smell. So let's talk a little bit more about how these trees grow. And so black cottonwood is another of those pioneer species that I was telling you about. So they um, they need, they're usually one of those species that grows first after there has been some sort of disturbance on the land. But it really likes moist and wet areas. So it can be inside a riparian zone or inside um, inside deep water and that's sort of why beavers enjoy it so much, probably. <laughs> Not to mention their the sweetness of their stems. Um, so they also 
are very intolerant of shade. So they're one of those very, it's very fast growing, the fastest in our area because it cannot grow in shade. And um, it can live to be about 200 years old. The wood though is quite soft and pretty prone to rotting. So it's usually notorious for having large limbs fail or blowing down in the wind. So we had a very windy uh, weekend this August. I think it was August 29th that weekend. And even in our parking lot here, we had a cottonwood tree come down. So they, they don't do well in heavy wind areas. Um, and they're not really known for their lumber and they're pretty poor firewood options because they smell really bad when they're burned. So don't use cottonwood in your indoor fireplace. Tips of the trade. So I guess I'm going to stop there for right now and find out if anybody has any questions so far. And those are those are the major trees. And then as um, and if Bethany, you can tell me how much time we have left, I'll go over some more of the less common trees um, as time allows. Okay, well, thanks, Lauren. Well, I mean, we're from from when we start actually started at 1.30. Um, okay. You know, we've still got about 15 more minutes and it looks like everybody's still here and has time to stay, so um, so that's great. Um, and, and, you know, and, and it'll be, this will be on YouTube later too. So if anybody does have to go because we're going over, um, you know, they can always check it out later. Um, I did just remind everybody a few minutes ago that they could type in any questions at any time. Um, so it doesn't look like anybody has any questions because um, one of our attendees says you're doing a great job. So oh, great. You, must, you must be covering everything and, <laughs> and not leaving any questions um, left, which is nice. Okay, well, if, I, <laughs> if it's too detailed, let me know, too, because I <laughs> sometimes drown you. I understand. <laughs> it's great. Um, so, yeah, so if you want to go ahead and, and go into some, um, to some other trees, I think that'd be great. And I'll, again, just encourage anybody to type any questions at any time, and, and you can take those um, again. So, yeah, I mean, if you want to go another 15, 10, 15 minutes, that'd be great. Sure, perfect. I got plenty of trees for you. All right, so let's talk about some other lowland conifers here. So Sitka spruce. Um, Sitka spruce is a really imp impressive tree, I think. Um, and it grows in cool and wet areas. Um, it's most prevalent in the rain and fog-soaked coastal areas. So all across the Western Olympic Peninsula and then down all the Western coast of Northwestern Oregon too. Um, and it's not – oh, sorry. Um, so Sitka spruce is a tree that you, um, that you could probably identify by its bark alone. Um, it has this very distinct bark, which ranges in color from gray to reddish brown. And it has flaky scales that kind of look like cornflakes or potato chips that are just stuck to the side of it. And, you know, it's usually described as light gray to reddish brown, but I really think it looks almost purple, to be honest. But you're not going to see another tree that has this type of bark in our area. It's really beautiful, actually, I think. Sometimes it even makes you hungry from the little chips stuck to the side. Don't eat them, though. They're not as tasty as potato chips. Um, so spruce is also very another distinctive feature of spruce is that it has very sharp stiff needles um, in fact it's pretty much one of the best ways to tell a spruce is you shake its hand and if it hurts then it's a spruce don't shake it too hard because i don't want you to start bleeding all over the place so they are that sharp i have definitely cut my finger on a spruce needle before um, it's the other distinguishing characteristic about its needles is that they grow on the stem almost like a woody peg. So if you pull the needle off, then it leaves these little pegs on the stem. So you can sort of see that in the picture in the bottom left there. Some of those needles have been pulled off and it leaves those little pegs where the base of the needle was. Um, the cones, though, um, sort of contradictory, um, con 
uh, I can't say that word today, sorry, sort of in contrast uh, to the sharpness of its needles um, are really sort of soft, thin, and papery. So they're actually pretty docile compared to the, the needles on the tree. Um, it's intermediate in its shade tolerance, so it can grow um, underneath another canopy, but it can't, but not in a very thick canopy. Um, and it often, it sorry, it it often gets established um, on the coast, so that's really mostly where you're going to see it. And they usually live to be about 400 years and can can grow up to uh, 250 feet tall. One sort of interesting fact about Sitka spruce too is that it has a superior acoustic property. So it's often desired uh, to be used for making musical instruments. Um, and sometimes you'll see um, these little woody tufts at the edges of the Sitka spruce branches. They kind of look like cones a little bit, but they don't look like the papery cones that you see in the upper left-hand corner of your picture. Um, they, they, those are actually like swollen galls, so it's sort of like a reaction to a beetle. It doesn't really hurt the tree. That's just the tree's reaction uh, to the beetle sort of nipping on its branches. It's sort of the same. I would equate it to you getting a mosquito bite almost. So it's that sort of reaction. All right, so Western white pine is, I think, a very stately tree and really beautiful. Um, it's a white pine, and it has, which means it has five needles per fascicle. So the pines um, have these little groupings of needles. If you can see in the picture, second from the, the right, there's these little tufts of needles almost. Um, different pine trees will have different numbers of those and that's sort of how you can sometimes identify the type of tree. White pines have five needles within each of those little tufts that we call fascicles. And one easy way to remember that is that the word white has five letters. So it always has five needles. Um, Western white pine is a large tree. It grows very tall and slender, as you can sort of see from this picture all the way to the right. Um, and it has distinctly large banana-shaped cones. Um, pretty distinctive pine cone from any other of our native trees. And they can grow up to almost a foot long, so they're actually really large. Um, they can grow in wide elevation range, so you can see them on the uh, at sea level, but you can also see them up in the mountains. And they typically like it pretty sunny. Um, they're typically also pretty valuable as a lumber species. Uh, and they used to be much more prevalent, but we had an exotic fungal disease called Western White Pine Blisterus that sort of decimated a lot of the species across North America. And, um, and all white pines across across the country, not just this species of white pine. Um, and it develops these blistery kinkers that are orange, and what happens is they sort of girdle the tree the way you would if you had removed all the bark on a tree, and it kills them. Um, and it's really hard to manage because that particular fungus actually requires an alternate host. So half of its life it spends on a shrub, and then the other half of its life it uses the the tree f for its sugars and kills the tree in the process. So if it only attacked the tree, then we might have some easier management tools. But because of that um, that um, alternate host cycling, we have a lot of trouble managing it. So we've lost a lot of our white pines. But we're doing a lot of research in order to try and um, increase the diversity of the seeding of the trees and to try to use trees that we know are resistant to the, the disease to actually use those in our seed orchards to try and increase more blister rust resistant white pines. And it works pretty well. We're starting to bring some of the numbers up more. But again, that sort of, uh, we're still playing with genetics a little bit there in that there's only a 50% chance that it'll be resistant because 
of the way that the genes interact with each other when they're bred. So hopefully that made sense. <laughs> okay, so that's our Western white pine species. Um, lodgepole pine and shore pine are actually the same species, but they have two very distinct forms. So the coastal form or the shore pine um, is on the right hand side and it's a very short tree with a twisted and gnarled shape. And lodgepole pine is our inland form of the tree and it's usually in the mo mountain form and it's very straight and tall. And so the Latin name contorta is pretty fitting because it's contorted coastal form. And its common name, lodgepole, is sort of recognizing of the straight stem for the inland form. Um, and this tree was also used by Plains Indians as teepee poles. So um, that's another way that it got the lodgepole name. Um, lodgepole pine is really common throughout Western North America, and it's a pretty important lumber species. Um, it's not as common on the west side as it is east of the Cascades, uh, but shore pine is pretty common on the west side of the Cascades. But both you can find both forms of the tree on either side. Um, these pines have two needles per fascicle. So remember I was talking about the bundles of the needles on each stem. So this particular tree only has two needles in each bundle and that pretty hel helps it distinguish it a little bit from the white pine. Um, their needles are also relatively short and more toughy compared to the white pine needles which are a little bit longer. Um, their cones are egg-shaped and they typically have strong um, sharp prickles on them. So if you grab the cone you can feel little pokes on those. Uh, lodgepole pine has what we call serotonous cones, meaning that they're sort of glued together by sap. So they actually are adapted to fire in that way is that the fire heats up the sap and it melts. And that's what opens the cones up to release the seeds. So it creates um, opportunity for the seeds to be dispersed over bare soil, which is what it needs to regenerate. So the trees adapted really well to its environment that way. Um, in, in our region, lodgepole and shore pine do really well competitively against other trees, mostly because it does really well in nutrient poor sites. And so it can grow in really dry sites, really sandy areas, on coastal bluffs, on the shores with howling winds, and so in marshes. And so there's a lot of, they're just sort of a, a tree that can withstand a lot of torture basically. So they tend to do really well in areas where we can't find a lot of other trees. So um, it's really, it's really great to be able to to see that they've been able to create this sort of vertical um, differentiation in areas where we have really poor nutrient sites. So we've added a tree component to our other shrub components in a lot of areas. All right, so I want to talk about a grand fir because this is one of our um, this is one of our true firs that we have here. And so that's denoted by their abies genus. So the first, the first word in their Latin name is abies, and that's their true firs. And these are, um, these have round buds. So you'll notice, so remember the Douglas fir had that lancelet bud, that pointy bud. These have round ones. So if you're not sure between the difference, there's a good way to tell. Um, and then these have also very symmetrical branching patterns. Um, so they branch out in very, usually opposite from each other. If you sort of look at the branch in the bottom left, you'll see that the larger branches, there's always um, some one meeting it on the other side. Uh, these needles are uh, dark green and they also have the two stomatal bands underneath but if you'll notice the leaves on these trees that they grow they're alternate so there's a long and a short and a long and a short so that's pretty distinctive of a grand fir. Their cones are very papery and if they sit upright on the tree as compared to Douglas fir those were pendant cones so those hung down 
and um, they shed by layer. So you never actually typically find a full grand fir cone on the ground unless they're green and all sappy um, that it didn't reach maturity on the tree. So those are pretty rare to find. Let's see. Okay, I'm, I'm running out of time here and I wanted to, I have, um, maybe you could take a survey of the people for me, of the people who are here. And I have a couple broadleaf trees that I could talk about, but we seem to only have time for maybe one more. So I'll, maybe you can ask the group what they would prefer to hear about. Okay. Okay, so I have, we can, I have pictures on bitter cherry, Pacific madrone, uh, willow, or Oregon white oak. Okay. So maybe take a vote <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in the chat box. <laughs> Let's do one more. I, I want to give the broadleaf species their due, their due as well. So. Yeah, I, I'll tell. My vote is for the is for the madrone because it's always my favorite. Okay. So let's see what our what our attendees say. We'll give them a second. But Lauren, I just want to thank you again so much because you've done obviously you've done a great job. Brandon's voting for Willow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Skylar, vote. Oh, we got two votes for Willow, so I guess we'll go for that one then. <laughs> okay, sounds good. So good. let me. I love Willows too. too. I, I agree with you guys. Good. <laughs> So I'll just glaze over these. So this is what a bitter cherry looks like. And the bark typically has these horizontal lenticels on it. That's very distinctive. So there's the cherry. And then Pacific Madrone is that peely bark. And they have their uh, leaves are evergreen. And they're on the tree all year round. And the females have these beautiful orange berries. So that's a quick glance at Madrone. And then cask oh I didn't say I had cascara but cascara just quick have these beautiful um, leaves when you look underneath the very symmetrical veins and cascara is known for its um, laxative properties so if you're hiking through the woods you're a little stuffed up take a little bit of a chew on a piece of bark of cascara and that'll solve your problem. Don't eat too much because it works very well. It's used in all of our commercial laxatives. But don't eat the berries because um, they're not good for humans, but birds love them. So there's cascara. Okay, so Pacific willow. So <coughs> um, there's a ton of different varieties of willows and you can that can be found all over the place. And in fact, it's really pretty easy to identify a willow. Um, what's the hard part is to distinguish what type of willow it is from any other willow. Um, they're typically characterized by their slender leaves uh, that are often broader at the base and then get more narrow to the to a point at the tip. And But one notable exception is our Pacific willow. And it's got spear-like leaves. Um, so these very, and they're very long. And they come to a very narrow point. And because of this, Pacific willow is really the easiest to distinguish from other willows. Um, so they're also characterized, so willows can also be characterized by their fuzzy catkins that emerge in the spring. So that's the picture all the way on your left. Um, they're very widespread and you often see them in very wet areas so or what you'd call riparian areas next to streams and rivers and ponds and lakes and things like that. Um, the four most common willows in our area are Pacific willow, hooker's willow, schooler's willow, and sitka willow. And Pacific willow and schooler's willow are the most likely to get tall enough to be considered a tree. And so that's why I have that uh, picture of Pacific Willow in here. Um, also, really distinctive of willows, if you're not sure if it has a cher if it's a cherry or because it's young, if you look at the picture on the bottom right hand side, it has these little sub leaves. And so these sort of like these wings that go around the base where um, the leaf attaches to the stem. And so that's very distinctive of willows. So you'll always see that. So that's our, our willow. Let's see, and a quick Oregon 
oak. It looks like a very distinctive oak tree. It has these acorns, and they typically grow in uh, dry areas in open grasslands. So they're pretty common on Whidbey Island for those of you in Washington. And they're very common actually as you get close to the Cascade foothills and um, in, in Oregon and then on drier sides on the eastern sides of the state. Um, so yeah, so that's Oregon white oak. And so I'm just going to finish really quickly on how to get some more information from WSU Extension. Um, I work in the North Puget Sound, but here's the, the top line is our website for the whole program across the state. And then Oregon State University also has a really great program for those of you that are in Oregon. Um, we have a lot of online classes in our Forest Stewardship University. So if you want to learn more about native trees that are on the more of the east side of the two states, um, or if you're looking at quick um, 30 to 40 minute videos on forest health or fire risk reduction and things like that, um, Forest Stewardship University has a ton of online map modules that are sort of pre-recorded presentations like the one I did today and you can they're really cheap they're like a dollar to three dollars each or you can buy like six for five dollars something like that so um, check out Forest Stewardship University and then Kevin Zobris the the forester who actually put together this presentation because he's uh, a great photographer put together this uh, native trees of western washington a photographic guide and it's a really beautiful book and it's got some really great pictures of trees of western washington so you can order that um, online and if you do a google search for it it's pretty easy to find and if you own your own forest land and you're looking for more management suggestions and more ecology related um, management techniques, um, our program, that website at the bottom is a, is a link to the North Puget Sound program. So if you're um, in the North Puget Sound of Washington, then we do coach planning classes that help you write management plans for your property. And then um, we also have a class coming up on how to sell logs from your property if you're interested in selling trees and things like that. So we got a lot of resources from Extension. If And so check out our website and see if there's opportunities for you to learn more. So thanks so much for inviting me and having me talk about native trees. Um, I love doing it. And I hope you all have a wonderful time on your next walk in the woods and are able to identify more of the trees you see. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lauren. Sure, I think, no problem. Uh, I, I was thinking I could tell by our audience's response to the, the trunk questions at the beginning that everybody knows that they that using all of their senses is important because no one was willing to just jump right into uh, <laughs> to answering that. So I think that's so cool that you, you everybody knew that and we're all uh, so excited to have learned more. So thank you so much. And the, um, the audience is, is sending their thank yous in the chat too. I know that because of our technical difficulties, you can't see it, but they're there and Everybody said they're excited to learn more too. So thank you. Oh, um, so it, it, you this uh, this presentation will be available on YouTube. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to get in and edit out the first um, <laughs> little bit when we were having trouble later on today. So it'll be a very nice looking presentation that you might want to share with your friends and uh, and help everybody learn more about our Cascadia forests. Um, I think it was cool too that Lauren mentioned about uh, one of the trees being used as medicine because our next uh, Cascadia Speaks webinar is actually about building a natural medicine cabinet. So um, from uh, Ravens Roots Natural School and that's on March 14th at noon. So mark, mark your calendars for that and join us then. And um, make sure you're following us and following um, hashtag Cascadia Speaks. And thank you again so much for Lauren. Thank you all so much for being here. And um, yeah, I'm excited to go out and check out some trees now too. <laughs> Thanks. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you.